Hello, my friends. My name is Jeremy Siskin. I'm the author of the Jazz Piano Fundamental series, which this is not the second book of. This is playing solo jazz piano. This is the second edition, which includes uh, lots of videos. And this is the second book of the Jazz Piano Fundamental series. Thanks to all of you who have bought it um, and studied it and are enjoying it and sending me great questions and feedback. I always really enjoy it. Um, so today I want to talk about push-offs, which is my term for this common thing that musicians do, uh, that pianists do as they're comping. And we're going to get into lots of details, but the general idea of a push-off is that you're repeating a chord. So instead of comping, with single chords or held chords, we're going to group some eighth note chords together. So let's get into some details here. Okay, so push-offs, first of all, if we're doing a two, two comp push-off, it needs to go from the on beat, from one of the beats, to the off beat. So push-offs are going to be two consecutive eighth notes, always going from the beat to the off beat. And that's important because we're going to be emphasizing that second note, so we're emphasizing the syncopation rather than the note on the beat. Listen to how it sounds if we do it the other way. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It always feels kind of stuttering to me, personally at least. So we can do a push off really from any beat. And we'll just use really simple kind of four note voicings. We'll do C major here. So we could do a push off on beat one. And I often teach this to my uh, more beginning students as like a variation of the Charleston. And if you're not familiar with the Charleston, it's a rhythm uh, that comprises the beat one and the and of two. And so here I'm basically adding an extra comp on the and of one, and then still playing the two comps of the Charleston on beat one and the and of two. I don't know if that was clear. If not, these two comps make up the Charleston and then this one was just added. So. Here's the regular Charleston. Two, three, four, two, two, three, four. This is the Charleston with a push off. Just gives it a little, a little more zing. We can also add the push off to the Charleston on the on beat two, so that now we have a push off from beat two to the end of two. Da, do da. We're about to talk about articulation, so hang in there, but it is important. All right, so the first measure is, second measure is, and again, I'll play for you the Charleston and then this variation of the Charleston using a push off. This is the Charleston. And then add this push off on beat two. All right, so let's take a second and talk about uh, the motion that you want to use in the articulation because this makes all the difference. If this push off, if these two chords sound like two separate chords, that's where jazz goes to die. <laughs> if it's duh. Technically you're playing the rhythm correctly, but the articulation and the motion is wrong, and so the feeling ends up being all wrong. So what you need to do is to play it legato. Now playing legato on repeated notes is actually kind of difficult. Um, what it requires from you is a smooth motion that comprises both chords. So what I recommend, and let me stand up here, I'm gonna pretend that this is the key bed here. 
the first key I'm going to sink into, and then I'm going to play the second key on the way up. So ba da, da da, da da. Notice how different that is than if I play two separate da 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 da. Right, totally different motion. And the difference really lies not so much in the hand and fingers, although there certainly you know is a difference there. But it's more in how the arm and particularly the elbow, uh, da, do da. How particularly in how the arm and elbow are functioning, do da. They're sinking into the key. Now, from a purely technical standpoint, to make it sound legato, what needs to happen is the key can't come all the way back to its resting place before being replayed. Okay, so as I'm coming up, I'm not letting the key come all the way back up and then reattack because that's going to make it sound like two separate chords. Instead, I'm staying in the key and then attacking as that key is coming up. So listen again to the difference if I play them separately. It's no good if I play them together, or sorry, if I play them legato, linked together in this way I've described. nice accent on that second one. Um, so it's almost like you're spring loading a spring on the first one and then letting it bounce off on the second one. Do that. Now I have this exercise that I often show students about doing this in slow motion. So if you're up for it, uh, do this with me. So what we're going to do First of all, is we're going to press our chord down silently. Now, this might not be possible if you're playing on a keyboard or electric piano, but on a real piano, you should be able to press your chord all the way down without making any sound. And then you're going to release these keys truly as slowly as you physically can. So, you know, I actually look at the wood on the sides of the keys and see it just gradually shrinking and lifting, 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 lifting. And then right as it gets towards the top, maybe you know, a millimeter from the top. I don't know how big a millimeter is truly, but about that, you spring back. And I do it kind of this way with my elbows. So again, three steps, silently press the key. That wasn't quite silent. And what that silent pressing of the key does is that it gets you engaged with just how much effort is needed to press the key down and how much room there is to come up. So gets you really focused on the depth of the key. Okay, and then you're gonna slowly, slowly, slowly let it come up, and then before it gets to the top, snap back. One more time, press key silently, let come up as slow, slow, slow as you can, slow, 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 before it gets to the top, snap back. And that's the exact same motion. All right, back to our exploration here. Possible, so we've gone through beat one, beat two, those can be added to the Charleston. Um, if we're looking for kind of known comping rhythms to add push-offs to on beat three and beat four, we could use the reverse Charleston, which is beats one, sorry, <laughs> the end of one and beat three. And we could have a push-off added on beat three, so going from beat three to the end of three. So I don't think that was clear at all. So these two comps are the reverse Charleston, beat and of one and beat three, and this is added to create push off. So one, two, three, four. Here's the regular reverse Charleston, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. With the added Cool. And then of course there's beat four, and beat four is a really fascinating place for a push-off because our chord frequently changes on beat one. That's not news to anybody. And if we're doing a push off from beat four to the end of four, then oftentimes 
well, I shouldn't say oftentimes, that if the chord's changing, we actually need to change chords in the middle of that push off. So that this chord is C major, and then this chord is F major. So the two chords of the push off here will actually be different. One, two, three, four. Let me put this into a harmonic context you might be more familiar with. I'll do it on the blues. So, and then around this, I'm gonna also be adding an end of two. And so to me, this is like an ornamentation of what we sometimes call the red garland comping pattern, where we have comps on the and of two and and of four. And so now I've added a comp on beat four to create a push off. So the regular red garland comping pattern would be one, two, three, four, five. push-offs on beat four, notice now how I'm going to change chords between beat four and the end of four. One, two, three, four. Sometimes I'm creating motion between those chords when there actually isn't motion between the chords. And that is something that we really frequently do on push offs. And we have two main ways of doing it. The first one I call sidestep, sidestepping. And that means that we're going to create basically an entire neighbor chord by displacing the notes of the chord you're targeting by a half step. So let's say that we're targeting a C major. Actually, here, let's. We're gonna go back up to this Charleston. Uh, here, I like this one. And I wanna create a little bit of motion here. So we're gonna call this chord the target, because that's the second chord of the sidestep. Or sorry, that's the second chord of the push off. And so now I'm gonna displace every note of that, of that chord by a half step. So I'm gonna target each note of that chord by a half step, would be another way of saying it. Uh, so let me use, let me go a half step below. I could go either a half step below or a half step above. And now instead of, I have, I'll show you that same thing on this reverse Charleston. So the second chord of the push off is going to be our target. <laughs> it's too thick, it's erasing all the notes. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go a half step below. I think it's going to sound a little bit nicer here than going a half step above, but both are possible. So here, here, here it was before, two, three, four. Sounds totally fine like that, but a little bit more colorful with a little sidestep. The second method is what I call tonicization. And tonicization means, again, we're targeting the second chord of the push off and we're gonna add the five chord, the dominant chord of whatever that might be. So, you know, when I say tonicization, I mean that we're pretending that this chord now is your tonic chord. So let's take this scenario here. We're targeting an F major seven so the five chord of that is gonna be a C7. Okay, so let me write a basic C7. And then when we do tonicization, like most of the time that we play dominant chords in jazz, we're definitely gonna to wanna to add some alter tones. So uh, let's do a flat 13 and a flat nine on the C7. Resolve. 
involving Yaakov Avinu. Let's look at a different case. Uh, let's go back here. So now I'm targeting. I've already got the cord circled in this very thick purple lavender pen. So we're targeting a C major 7. So we're going to use a G7 as the target. Here's a G7 with no alterations. I'm gonna be modest, I'll just add a strike five. I think it's gonna sound even better if we add, let's say a sharp nine. It's nice, right? It again, creates more motion. Let me play all three versions. So one with no motion, with just repeated chords. One with a sidestep and one with tonicization. So here's three C majors, uh, and maybe it'll be nice if you can <laughs> if you can see that. And it's not working. Cool. Pro very professional. So professional, you guys. Am I gonna be super responsible and uh, go back and edit this out? Absolutely not. Who would? Who needs it? So uh, here's with no changes, right? Listen, the, the articulation still sounds good. Here's with a sidestep from below. Here's with a sidestep from above. We didn't do that, but if we target it with half step from above, and here's with um, a tonicization. I'll use the same altered tones I wrote out. I'll use some different altered tones, but still a tonicization. All right. Maybe the last thing that we need to talk about here before I, I set you loose to, to try this is that we can also have what I like to call double and triple push-offs. And what that means is that instead of just having two chords in a row, we could have three chords, even four chords in a row. I mean, I guess we could have a million chords in a row, but uh, I think we start, <laughs> we start uh, losing any gains that we're getting. Um, and the important thing as we add chords is that we still want it to end on an offbeat. So, we would add chords before the beginning of a push off rather than after. So for instance, we could do a triple push off. In this case, it would both start and end on an offbeat. Ba -do -da. And these all have to be legato, all three have to be legato, no space allowed in between. Absolutely can add sidesteps, tonicization stuff in here. It could be. And this could be on, on any beat. All right, let's look at a triple push off. These are really just my terms. I'm not sure that anybody in the quote-unquote industry is calling it a triple push-off, but soon they will be when I take over, when I have my way. Okay, uh, enough of the even, evil villain speech. Um, by the way, before I go on, one great place to hear a double push-off is Hank Mobley's recording of Remember from Soul Station. Winton Kelly is playing piano, and because the melody goes it's got these three-note groups, Winton Kelly responds with a three-note push-off. So uh, again, that's Remember from Soul Station by Hank Mobley. All right, here's a triple push off. Again, the key, you gotta stay in the keys for all these. You can't, uh, you don't want dun, 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 dun. That sounds like garbage. Don't do it. Don't be that guy or gal. Uh, so you hear that this, this articulation here, you gotta really work. It's like, do, va, do, dit on this 
uh, triple push push up. Okay, so that hopefully gives you some things to fool around with. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, uh, you'll find some of this stuff in uh, both of these Jazz Piano Fundamentals books. Uh, some in book one, some in book two. Uh, if you're more interested in solo piano, uh, this is the book for you. Second edition, playing solo jazz piano, available wherever fine books are sold. Um, if you um, finish this video all the way through, why don't you put the word martini in the chats? Because you deserve one, I think. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a great one.